Hello, my name is James Robson, and I'm the Victor and William Fung Director of the Harvard Asia Center. The Asia Center's author conversation series is aimed at highlighting insightful engagements with authors of books published recently by the Asia Center Publications Program and other publishers on topics of interest to the Asia Center's mission of fostering research on Asia in transnational and transregional perspectives. We very much hope you enjoy the conversations. Hi, welcome to the Harvard Asia Center's Author Conversation Series. My name is James Robson, and I'm the James C. Kralik and Yun Lee Lo Professor in the Department of East Asian Languages and Civilizations, and also the Victor and William Fung Director of the Asia Center. Joining me today is Professor Charles Hallisey, the Yehan Numata Senior Lecturer in Buddhist Literatures in the Harvard Divinity School at Harvard University. And today we'll be discussing Professor Richard Jaffe's recent book, Seeking Shakyamuni, South Asia in the Formation of Modern Japanese Buddhism, published in the Buddhism and Modernity series at the University of Chicago Press in 2019. Professor Jaffe is a professor in the De Department of Religious Studies at Duke University, whose main focus is on Japanese Buddhism. And in addition to the book we'll be discussing today, he is also the author of Neither Monk Nor Layman, Clerical Marriage in Modern Japanese Buddhism that was published by Princeton University Press in 2000. And he's also the editor of the selected works of D.T. Suzuki uh, and published through the University of California Press, the first volume in, in 2014, and also the author in, of a number of groundbreaking articles. He is also currently the director of the Asia Pacific Studies Institute at Duke University. Professor Jaffe's book, Seeking Shakyamuni, South Asia and the Formation of Modern Japanese Buddhism, which moves between South and Southeast Asia and Japan, fits in wonderfully with the mission of the Harvard Asia Center, which is to generate and share knowledge about Asia in transnational and transregional perspectives in order to foster teaching, collaboration, and innovation across and beyond cultural and disciplinary boundaries. So we're very happy to be able to discuss the work with him here today. So welcome. Professor Jaffe. Thank you. Thanks for so, having me. So we, uh, we'd like to open up um, with an initial question. Um, just to think, uh, given the way that this book crosses over so many different types of boundaries uh, and is quite new and innovative in the field, how did this project begin for you? And what were some of the ways that it uh, changed as you uh, proceeded with the research? And uh, related to that, why uh, was it important for you to actually bring uh, Japan in South and Southeast Asia into conversation with each other? So uh, the book began, uh, it really grew out of, towards the tail end as I was finishing work on my first book, Neither Monk Nor Layman, and was looking at a number of figures in uh, Japanese Buddhism in the late 19th, early 20th centuries, I began to notice that a number of these individuals had made trips to South and Southeast Asia. And uh, Shaku Unsho uh, being one of them, Kuruma Takudo is another figure I talk about in neither monk nor layman, a Soto cleric who uh, created the first Soto marriage ceremony. He wrote the marriage ceremony for Soto Zen in the early 20th century. He was a very, what I would call a progressive figure in the Soto school. Uh, I noticed uh, another person was uh, Oda Tokuno. And so I saw these individuals had gone to South and Southeast Asia, but not much had been written about their travels there. And as I poked around more, I uncovered a whole range of travel diaries and uh, individuals who had gone to South and Southeast Asia. And uh, thought that that would be a really interesting project to work on. And I began discussing this with my Japanese colleagues. And uh, the first the project took me a long time to complete for a variety of reasons, one being a, a major illness and another uh, being distracted by my work on DT Suzuki, which sort of emerged at the same time. But uh, uh, Sueki Fumihiko sensei, uh, at uh, Todai at the time, was putting together an issue uh, for Shiso, uh, the journal Thought in Japan, on uh, modern Buddhism, Kindai Bukyo, 
And I had talked to him about this research and he said, well, why don't you do an essay for it? So the initial essay that grew into this book came out in Japanese first and then was published in the Journal of Japanese Studies as Seeking Shakyamuni. And that was my first really pass at this material. And that was, I, I forget, it may have been 2003, 2004 when that came out, maybe even a little earlier. And how did the project change? Is the project cha over time, I narrowed uh, the project. Initially, I was going to look at inter-Asian conversations broadly and the way in which inter-Asian inter conversations shaped the modernization of Japanese Buddhism, the way in which Japanese Buddhists rethought Buddhism for the 20th century, in part influenced by Charlie's uh, essay on intercultural mimesis in Curators uh, of the Buddha. Uh, that essay, and he talks a bit about this, it was, it, as, as you discussed it, it was about the exchange between people like Kiko Duve Sumangala and Riz Davids and the role that those conversations played going both directions, influenced both directions. But what I saw as I began looking at this material was a, a net of conversations, a network of conversations within Asia, among Asians, hmm. without Europeans and Americans present oftentimes reflecting on what Europeans and Americans thought about Buddhism in Asia, but it was amongst themselves. And I believed and, and concluded that this was an important set of conversations that helped shape uh, Japanese Buddhism for the mm -hmm. 20th century and Asian Buddhism more broadly. It really was the creation of a world Buddhism or Asian, a notion of an Asian Buddhism. And it, you know, important participants in it were the Asians themselves. One of the things, uh, maybe to ask, how, what sense did you get of how, uh, say, Asians in other parts of Asia, in Southeast Asia, uh, Sri Lanka, how they were perceiving the Japanese interest in, in them? I think, uh, you know, the, the most intensive intense conversation that I've, I've looked at was between the, a couple of Shingon priests and Hikaduve Sumangala and uh, Panyasekara, that, those individuals in uh, early 20th century, late well, actually late 19th century uh, Ceylon, Sri Lanka. And there was deep interest among the Shingon clerics, Unsho and his nephew, Shakozen, whom I write about at length, in, in precepts and precept practice and monastic practice. And uh, they, as Shane Clark has written about the revival of interest in the Mula Sarvastavada lineage in Japan, precept lineage. And Unsho was interested in that as well. And they were really searching, Unsho in particular, for what could be considered the true precept lineage. And I think some of the influence of Orientalist scholarship on Buddhism, sort of uh, Pali Buddhism is the original Buddhism, that kind of uh, uh, way of viewing Buddhism influenced Unsho enough, even uh, though I don't know how deeply immersed he was in that scholarship, it influenced him enough that he saw sending somebody to Sri Lanka to investigate their precept practice and monastic practice would be worthwhile. And so uh, he was too old at the time. I think he was in his 50s. Mm. So it shows you, you know, when the life expectancy was probably 60 at most, 50 was, it was uh, old. But he, so he decided to ask his nephew, who was also ordained as a Shingon cleric. Uh, they were from out in the Kumano, uh, Kumano region. He sent his nephew, Kozen, Shak Kozen, to Sri Lanka to practice for a while and see what was going on and study the precept lineage. And he sent a series of letters to Kozen inquiring to Hikaduve and his compatriots about precept practice. And in response, Sumangala sent back some letters that are uh, 
in, uh, there's a volume of his letters and writings that's preserved. Uh, it's published in Ceylon that Anne Blackburn sent me some pages from. And in those letters, he's asking about the nature of Japanese Buddhism when it began, mm. uh, the nature of the practice there. So there was this interest in Japanese Buddhism, but my, my sense uh, from those letters and from the uh, letters that uh, E.R. Uh, Gunaratna, who was the lay patron uh, of uh, both Shaku Kozen and Shaku uh, Soen when they were in Sri Lanka, indicate uh, a, a pretty shocking lack of knowledge about Buddhism in East Asia amongst the Salinese Buddhists. Mm -hmm. I was really quite amazed by how little they know, but it makes, it makes perfect sense. Right. They just did not consider that part of their um, area of concern, perhaps. Mm -hmm. uh, it changes, though, with particularly people like Dharmapala, then going to Japan and Olcott going to Japan, uh, they begin to stimulate interest among the Salinese in Japanese Buddhism. But I have to say, I, it, from what I've studied, for the book and research for the book, the interest was always stronger from the Japanese towards South and Southeast Asian Buddhism than vice versa. That this, the uh, Sri Lankan Buddhists were pretty much content with what they had. The Japanese Buddhists were wrestling with this model of, this Orientalist model of Buddhism. It made Pali Buddhism the original Buddhism and how to deal with that kind of that ideology, that understanding, and how to justify the legitimacy and orthodoxy of Mahayana Buddhism was the big project that was mm. sort of motivating much of this interest. Mm. The, the ironic piece here is that Kozen converts yeah. to Theravada Buddhism, or to, well, to Sri Lankan Buddhism or Pali Buddhism, right. and returns and tries to spread it in, in Japan and never succeeds, yeah. although he does send a series of disciples to Sri Lanka for ordination, hoping to begin an ordination, legitimate uh, Pali Buddhist ordination, you know, from based on the, the Pali canon, uh, the Vinaya, uh, an ordination in Japan, but it, it fails. And towards the end of his life, he, he says to his one of his disciples, I am a failure. I, hmm. My life has been wasted as a result of being unable to do complete this task. So, one of the things also that maybe helps to understand the difference in terms of Japanese appreciation of what's going on in Southeast Asia, Sri Lanka, and the lack of interest in the opposite way is that perhaps Japanese Buddhists were kind of comfortable with, used to a kind of Buddhist pluralism that didn't exist in uh, the Theravada countries. And so then when someone coming from Japan who is different, there's like not many categories to put them in. And the very fact that people coming from Japan wouldn't know how to behave in a religious setting in Thailand or Sri Lanka. Uh, they, they wouldn't know how to worship. They wouldn't know what the rituals are. That so you would just say, well, you know, what are you, who are you? Uh, mm -hmm there was less uh, resources for the interface, perhaps, uh, aside from the Orientalist um, things, but just in terms of life or practice. The, there may have been less resources in Southeast Asia and Sri Lanka than there were in Japan. Yeah, and I think that the Sri Lankan Buddhists took it as confirmation of their uh, orthodoxy. That's right. That the Japanese, particularly someone like Kozen and then Soen, both were interested in ordination. Okay. And Soen decided that it was so fractious, the ordination based on caste in Sri mm. Lanka. He didn't want to get involved in all that. Right. And decided to try to get ordained in, in Siam. And for mm. some reason, that did not work out. He got to Siam and they would not ordain him there. So he returned to Japan. Mm. But uh, to his disappointment. But Kozen was ordained by Samangala, mm -hmm. the Temple of the uh, Tooth. And 
then went on and spent another number of years there practicing. And I think for Sumangala, this was just, you know, the interest from people like Riz Davids and then from the Japanese, this was a Buddhist metropole, really. Right. Mm -hmm. This is where people were coming to see what Buddhism was. That's right. And yeah. this was confirmation of that, I think, for That's the right. Shimankans. Now, yeah. one of the questions uh, you raised, James, you asked about my travels in South and Southeast Asia. And one of my deep regrets about this project is because uh, I mentioned I uh, had an illness, uh, I was uh, very ill with cancer. Uh, diagnosed in 2010, I began to get ill. In retrospect, I know now, probably 2008, 2009, I was immuno, I've been immunocompromised and was unable to travel to South and Southeast Asia for this mm. project, which made it, you know, I, I had to then, I, it probably would take me five more years to write the book had I been able to go. Yeah. But in any case, I was unable to look at archives there, and I know that documents exist in both Sri Lanka and in uh, places like Calcutta at Calcutta University, that there are letters from the Japanese who taught at Calcutta University in the Calcutta University archive. And I also know I was contacted after I published the essay, Seeking Shakyamuni in the Journal of Japanese Studies, a doctor in London uh, who uh, is Sri Lankan contacted me and he is a relative of Gunataratna and uh, he is in charge of Gunataratna's estate in Gaul and he contacted me and was interested in reestablishing <laughs> contact with the Japanese temples from where uh, people like Kozen and Soen had come. So I put him in touch with my uh, Japanese contacts at Tokeji, where mm. Soen had been, and at um, uh, Saneji in Shin Yokohama, where Kozen, that was Kozen's temple. And he has been in touch with them, and they have come to visit mm. in Sri Lanka. So I served as sort of an inter mediary for that kind of conversation. But I myself was unable to go. The closest I came was my daughter went to Gaul mm. and stayed at the estate of Gunaratna. Um, uh, but that's, that's about as far as I got. So, yeah. But uh, that story actually does resonate with the, the sort of uh, motif that, that runs through the book too, of the inability of early Japanese to get to the South and Southeast Asia as well, but a, but a pressing desire, right? In a sense, it, it mirrors it. Um, that's right. That, that longing to go and to, go. to get there. Yeah. Yeah. I think, yeah. but I, I do, th you know, as I mentioned towards the end of the book, I think uh, it would be definitely worthwhile for South Asian scholars to take a look at, uh, at the archive at the University yeah. of Kampada and in Sri Lanka as well. And as I say, I think the context thus far, there have been some scholars who have gone. But the temple priests uh, at Saneji and Tokeji have been interested in reestablishing these contacts and the sort of geopolitics have mm. pushed people in that direction as well because as China has risen to become the second largest economic power, the Japanese and the South Asians, particularly the Indians, as a way of sort of counterbalancing strategically uh, China's influence in Asia, have been renewing their ties. And there have been a series of conferences on India-Japan relations, both historic and contemporary. And I think the Sri Lankans as well have, have been interested in renewing some of these old relationships that date back to the pre-colonial period mm -hmm. as well. So, Some of the interest in Sri Lanka is also due to patterns of aid for development. And so Japan being a major, major donor to uh, Sri Lanka and one that tends not to have too many political strings that come with the aid in the way that mm. uh, Europe, the EU or the United States might have. Mm -hmm. yeah. So in the fact that you know both are Buddhist countries, there's a mm -hmm. kind of, uh, appreciation of Japan on those grounds. 
Well, that was a big theme, you know, that was played upon by the, the Japanese uh, diplomats in the 19th, early 20th century, Nagaki mm -hmm. Manjaro, uh, when the relics were distributed from Pripawa mm -hmm. to Siam and then to Sri Lanka, he said, we'd like a piece, we're a Buddhist nation as well. And this was then uh, eventually that sort of uh, sense of uh, Buddhist fraternity across Asia was then played upon, built upon in the construction of notions of the East Asia co-prosperity sphere. Right. It goes through numerous iterations uh, in the, over the course of, the, of history. I mean, one of the problems I wrestled with, and I don't know how successfully in, in the book, was this sense of inevitability, mm -hmm. a kind of teleological view of history that ends with Japanese imperialism in Asia. And you can see how each of these pieces leads to that. But I kept trying to think about how the actors at the time, they would not have known where this would, mm -hmm. <laughs> would end in this way, how they would have been perceiving what they were doing as they were at the same time unwittingly providing the foundation for this greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere, for that ideology. Uh, One of the things though in Sri Lanka that's a, maybe a curiosity is that the story of Japanese Sri Lankan connections, one of the high points is that after the end of the Second World War, in which uh, someone who later became the president of Sri Lanka, J.R. Jayawardena, was present at one of the peace conferences and had spoke very forcibly against uh, severe reparations expected from Japan. Mm. Uh, so this memory in Sri Lanka is of, oh, there was a Buddhist solidarity uh, and, uh, that the Japanese have not forgotten. And mm. so. Nor, I mean, the Indians as well. There's that book by, I forget his first name, but Paul, one of the justices at the Tokyo war crimes trial. And he was appalled, uh, pardon the pun, appalled <laughs> at, at the uh, way in which justice was meted out to many of the Japanese. He actually felt as a South Asian, mm. that this was victor's justice, that they had, to, to some extent, what the Japanese had done during the war was no different what Europeans and Americans had been doing around the world. And uh, of course, there were war crimes committed as well, but some of what they were being convicted of were not war crimes in his eyes. And, and mm. he wrote a rather uh, vocal defense or, or attack on, on some of the findings of the trial. So yeah. I think that sentiment was there. I mean, this was another one of the big surprises for me in working on the project was the extent to which there was a revival pre Ambedkar, mm -hmm. India, of interest in Buddhist scholarship and Buddhist history and Buddhist archaeology among Indians mm -hmm. uh, and Indian scholars, uh, that uh, these great scholars of Sanskrit in India uh, were really quite. Um, forceful in their attempts to revive Pali studies and, and Sanskrit studies in India. And the, Jap and the Japanese played a role in that. And, and another piece that I think moving forward that would be worth looking at is these series of lectures at Calcutta University, uh, mm -hmm. beginning with uh, Yamakami Sogan and then Masuda Jiryo and uh, Kimura Nichiki or Kimura Nikki, the role they played in educating a generation of Indian scholars of Buddhism and sort of schooling them in the Mahayana, the Japanese Mahayana perspective, uh, how that shaped Indian Buddhist studies would be worth looking at people like TRV Murti and so on, their right. perspective on Buddhism, what influence was there it flowed out of Japan, I think is something worth considering. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think this, you know, the context of 
uh, you know, suggesting to scholars to uh, reassess those archives and do more work there on the Sri Lankan and also Indian side is really an important point well taken. Um, I would like to um, maybe just turn the uh, face towards Japan for just a, a minute as well too and think, I mean, the the subtitle of the book is South Asia and the Formation of, of Modern Japanese Buddhism, right? And um, and so uh, you make a very persuasive case, and I think even just in the in what you've said so far too, just about the significant role uh, that was played by the contact with South and Southeast Asia. Um, but this goes quite in the in the face of uh, previous scholarship on Japanese Buddhism, which had either ignored this or, in some cases, even downplayed it. Um, so uh, why do you think that's so? I mean, why did how did that narrative develop um, that where uh, your book comes along and, and is really overturning, I think, that uh, previous uh, kind of scholarly trajectory. And then uh, in, in, in addition to that, then just thinking a little bit about how, um, you know, in your own work on this and, and having spent time uh, working on the South and Southeast Asian material, how does that impact, you know, or force you and, and scholars of Japanese Buddhism to reconsider uh, the uh, type of scholarship that's been that's been going on uh, in, in recent years. Yeah, so you know, uh, one of the review, the anonymous reviews of the book, the manuscript when I submitted it, uh, the person uh, was somewhat critical that he said that actually Japanese Buddhism didn't change at all as a result of this. Mm. And I think this, you know, and I thought about that, and I, and I wrestled with this, and I think to some extent. That, that is true. Uh, you know, Kozen, of course, converts. That's the most prominent example. And he's, he's an anomalous figure. He's one of the few figures I saw in all of this who really was a world... He was a Buddhist. Mm -hmm. And he really escaped, to a large extent, the gravitational pull of nationalism at this age of rising nationalism, nationalisms in Asia. He's one of the few figures who transcended that to some degree. And I think Kawaguchi Ekai, much less so. Mm. But those two figures were more influenced by their travels and study in South Southeast Asia than many of the other figures who remain first and foremost Japanese Buddhists. But I, I thought about this and, you know, institutionally, liturgically, Japanese Buddhism is very uh, sticky. It does not change much. And I, my first book is about the uh, legalization, the decriminalization of clerical marriage. And that major shift with 90% of the clergy now married does not change liturgy, does not mm -hmm. change the sort of monastic I idealization of monasticism and so on in Japanese Buddhism. Uh, so if it's that resistant to change, it's, it's easy to see how it would not, really, uh, in an overt way, the liturgy, to my knowledge, hasn't changed. Although, again, there, I think it's worth looking to see whether or not this increased understanding of uh, the connection with South and Southeast Asian Buddhism doesn't figure in more subtle ways in the change of the liturgy, mm -hmm. in rewording of more accurate uh, uh, identification of name. So instead of Buddha was born in Magadha, Buddha was born in Lumbini, those sorts mm -hmm. of more subtle shifts, that those take place in liturgy. I've not looked across the board to see, but some of that may have happened. The other thing that I, I do think is for the average parishioner, is worshiping in a temple like the so-called modern temple in Kobe? This very strange temple with its Southeast Asian turrets, with uh, Southeast Asian style altar settings, with uh, Brahmi script surrounding Amitabha, with a Bodhi tree replacing Amitabha in the Raigo painting, uh, is worshiping in that context transformative in some way? Does it change the nature of worship? to be chanting the Shoshinge or listening to a Shin priest uh, 
talk about Shinran in that setting is that different than doing it at Nishi Honganji? Mm. Uh, again, Skiji Honganji, that major temple it, in Skiji in Tokyo that, uh, you know, most people who've been to Tokyo remember that temple if they go to Skiji because it's so, it stands out to such a degree, even today, mm -hmm. is the presence of that temple with its, uh, uh, what Ito Chuta, the architect, called the Gandharan style architectural features in the middle of Tokyo, does that change the understanding, self-understanding of average Japanese as they walk by that temple? Does that make them feel Asian in a broader way mm -hmm. than just having Sinitic style or traditional Japanese style temple architecture surrounding them? So I think that the changes there were significant but they're more subtle than, yes, they came back and they all began following Pali, chanting, you know, in Pali or something like that, or following the precepts mm -hmm. differently. Uh, that didn't occur. One thought I had uh, reading your book and noting the prominence in the early stages of learning about Southwest, Southeast Asia, the, by people who are associated with Shinshu, Mm -hmm. is that maybe in terms of a sensibility, what happened to Shinshu is that uh, it was not able to have a kind of a moment of demythologization of its history because that kind of Shinshu couldn't establish itself in the way that Theravada has, you know, like a very profound demythologization of its heritage. And so instead, you have a sensibility, perhaps, in Shinshu that is like a hyper-mythologization, that people say, yes, it's myth. And then, they, but, you know, so I'm thinking of reading people like Soga and so on, in which they are really quite comfortable with saying, you know, this is not historicist at all. But, and so that, you could say, maybe had a, a, a kind of effect on modern Japanese Buddhism for some uh, schools that... They, they embraced a kind of mythology, mythologization of the tradition in ways that were almost impossible to do in Thailand and Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I mean, this is an ongoing debate in modern Shin Buddhism with some people falling who, you know, go too far in saying that this is myth and being cast out as Ianjin, as heretics by... Mm -hmm the establishment for going too far in that direction, one of the, the draws, the compelling things about South and Southeast Asia, but particularly South Asia, for Shin Buddhists and for Nichiren Buddhists, who, when you think about the spectrum of, of Buddhism, they see themselves as the efflorescence of Buddhist teaching. And for the Mokpo period, for the period of the latter Dharma, but they also have the, the toughest road to hoe in terms of explaining themselves in light of this understanding of Buddhist origins mm -hmm. and the historicization of the tradition. Right. And part of what motivated Otani, James, you asked the question I think, about Otani, uh, the Otani expeditions to Central Asia, they were looking for texts that would show the early origins of the Pure Land Sutras in part. Mm -hmm. They were looking for evidence of the historical uh, depth to the tradition and gravitas to the, to the tradition. And another move that's made is, um, the, you know, again, and this is in terms of the visual and architectural elements that I talk about in, in the book, is to connect even if they can't do it historically by finding a sort of missing link text or something like that uh, as a, in, in their ex archeological ex expeditions, to demonstrate affectively a connection between Shakyamuni, the historical Buddha, and Amitabha. And they do that visually by, in you know, the modern temple, the Mudandera in, in Kobe, by having the statue of Amitabha with the altar curtain, with the 
a Brahmi inscription from the Ashokan pillar at Lumbini mm -hmm. surrounding Amitabha and replacing in the descent of Amitabha Raigo uh, transom that they sculpted Amitabha with the Bod Bodhi tree. And so they're merging, at least visually and affectively, Shakyamuni and Amitabha and showing the legitimacy of Shin Buddhism as mm -hmm. part of this historical development of the tradition and grounded in Buddhist origins in a very deep way. And they have to do this, of course, uh, doctrinally as well. And people like Soga and others write about this connection uh, and that, you know, and, and as I mentioned in the book, Ake Garasu Haya writes about this, mm -hmm. the way in which uh, the, the Pure Land Sutras are the deepest intention of Shakyamuni being manifested. Right. Yeah, this is his deepest uh, understanding that's, come, that's being manifested in those sutras. So, um, and the other school that, of course, has a similar conundrum is the Nichiren school. Yeah. And they, too, are deeply interested in going, uh, their history and their relationship to the Indian tradition is different than Shin, of course. But Vulture Peak becomes really central for them, that return to where the Lotus Sutra was preached. Mm -hmm. And they see themselves as bringing back true Buddhism to India. This... Okay. Buddhism that's appropriate for the period and, and see themselves as, as bringing back, uh, you know, uh, Buddhism to India, as did uh, people like uh, Sakurai, uh, uh, Sakuragi Gicho, mm -hmm. uh, who, you know, the, the guy who's the editor of the Young East and a businessman, he talks about the Swadeshi movement in India and that the true Swadeshi movement would be to revive Buddhism and create a new Indian Buddhism. Mm -hmm. And that the Japanese way of repaying India for, and South Asia for all that it's giving to Japan by way of material goods, uh, cotton, raw cotton and so on, would be to return Buddhism to India and foster the growth of Buddhism in India once again. Mm. So. Actually, if you don't mind me, I'll pick up on that notion. You just mentioned the the issue of goods and cotton. And I think one of the really uh, fascinating things about your book and, um, you know, going into the deeply into uh, these uh, Buddhist figures and uh, sectarian universities and all those uh, contacts and everything that are going on. But at the same time, you also pick up a really interesting uh, thread in terms of, of new ways of, of conceiving of these connections throughout, uh, throughout Asia, actually, that are starting to take off during this period. And so this is uh, what you uh, were calling the cotton road and, and not just paying attention to the flows of doctrine, the flows of people, but actually the flows of material culture. And I found that really fascinating and I wanted to ask you if you could just say a little bit more about this kind of nexus or connections between uh, religion, technology, people, industry, and all of that. I think it's a, it, it all kind of started to make sense to me in terms of what those connections were like. Yeah, this was a, 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 you know, really exciting moment for me, actually, because I'd been uh, working on this for some time, and I, I was following, uh, you know, there's 30, 40 travel diaries that I, I was looking at and following the route, and it was quite clear there was a set route people were following, and then it became clear it was the steamship routes, and this was just as I was reading Sven Burkert's book, Empire of Cotton. Mm -hmm. And he mentions the rise of the cotton trade in Japan. And I started looking at the figures for the trade uh, and the rise of the trade. And a, a light bulb just lit up. And I understood that this was really the engine that was driving this just as trade routes, you know, were the routes that the Buddhism followed uh, as it entered Central Asia and China. Mm -hmm. that Buddhism, you know, I'm not a, a, a Marxist fundamentalist by any means, but this cotton trade really fostered the movement and made it easier and easier for Japanese Buddhists to make the journey in short order. And the trading companies and shipping companies began to uh, 
sponsor at discounted rates these pilgrimages to South and Southeast Asia by Japanese. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the technology, which, you know, you mentioned Nile Green's book, as I do in, in, in my book as well, I said that uh, Bombay uh, Islam, mm -hmm. the, the way in which, you know, he, he makes, he really stresses the way in which technology does not just denature or vitiate uh, religious practice, it actually can foster religious practice in all kinds of ways, through photography, through steamship routes, through trains. Uh, Tony Hubert, in his book on uh, Indian pil pilgrimage as well, makes this point that the, the Tibetans begin taking the trains to do the pilgrimage. And you can see in the chapter uh, following the Cotton Road, I mentioned you know, over a period of 50 or 60 days, this group that was sponsored yeah. by the Nippon Yusen Kaisha, the big shipping company, they travel all over the subcontinent in short amount of time. And so the, the train lines that the British have put in, in part to move cotton and control India, becomes this mechanism for uh, pilgrimage. Mm -hmm. or Japanese and, and other Asian Buddhists who want to see these archaeological sites that are being uh, restored by the British Archaeological Survey, among others. Mm -hmm. So, and, and then print technology, photography. Also, you know, the, not this was very expensive, as I mentioned in the book, incredibly expensive to go and travel to India, even with the rise of these steamship routes, but the Japanese begin photographing these sites and putting together these large coffee table type books. And they say in the prefaces to some of these books that this is, these books are for people who can't go to India and see these things. They can't see, walk in the footsteps of the Buddha, but they can at least do it virtually, we would mm. say, uh, yeah. through these photograph, collections of photographs. The other side of this, of course, is from the British perspective, uh, what the Japanese are doing, <laughs> they're mapping, they're photographing, mm. they're going into the hinterland. Everything they're doing is spying and My supporting man. the terrorists, i.e. those who are in favor of Indian autonomy or Indian, indep well, in not just independence, at, either at the state level or eventually what becomes India, the idea of Indian independence more broadly. Uh, so, and the, the British weren't alone, it turns out. I, I just recently read a book called The Impeccable Spy about this guy, Zorge, S-O-R-G-E, maybe it's Sorge, Richard Sorge, who was the, in Tokyo, he was a Russian spy mm. who became a Soviet spy, and he actually ticked off uh, the Russians to the invasion uh, by the Germans beforehand the information he picked up in Tokyo. But anyway, the Germans apparently felt, when were quite uh, admiring of the Japanese, the extent to which they felt most Japanese travelers were spying on behalf of the Japanese government. And I think the British were very suspicious of people like Kaoguchi Ekai or Otani Kozui because of their travels, the mapping, the photographing, and so on. Mm. So. Uh, and then yeah. the other uh, mechanism for spreading this again that I talk about a little bit in the book, things like the postal system and the postcard mm -hmm. and the photographic postcard uh, also become mechanisms for spreading information about uh, this uh, South Asia, South Asian travel, and then the importation of all of this material culture, images, paintings uh, to Japan. Architecture, yeah. Yeah, and spreading information about that to the Japanese public so they can then go and attend these shows and so on. So it really makes uh, the spread of this information much easier. Mm -hmm. Another question I have is whether you think that the situation of India, where you know, Buddhism was no longer a major religion, uh, that and that fact was part of the Orientalist critique in the service of uh, colonialism, that the Indians couldn't value the best of their own like, uh, heritage. And 
was this is one of the reasons why colonialism was not like a, uh, an assault on India. It was something that needed to happen. Uh, uh, whether you know, the Japan that, that fact that you know Buddhism wasn't a major religion in India got in the way of a kind of pan Asian solidarity between. Uh, uh, Japanese and in, uh, Indians, because they had given up Buddhism, they were colonized, and, and how that may have shaped how people thought about, you know, what modern Buddhism could be. You know, I don't, th I, I, the Japanese were aware of the decrepitude of the Buddhist tradition in, and Buddhist archaeological sites, particularly early on, the very earliest Japanese travelers who made it, and the uh, 1880s to India were somewhat appalled at the uh, way in which the sites had fallen into disrepair. And of course, this is the message you, you asked about Edwin Arnold. Edwin Arnold uh, goes to Japan and talks about Bodhgaya as the Mecca of Buddhism. And the ja he has a big influence on people like Shaku and Sho, who just, they begin these societies to revive these Buddhist sites in India, but it becomes rather than a way of disparaging uh, Pan-Asian sentiment, it enhances it because they see themselves, the Japanese see themselves as modernizing more successfully. Mm -hmm. okay. And again, having this burden then of helping their Asian brethren revive the tradition. Right. And uh, it also then dovetails with Indian efforts to revive the study of Buddhism, even if they're not Buddhists themselves, right. to revive Buddhist sites, to revive uh, Buddhist history, the study of Pali, as a way of creating a history right. to create a nation. Right. Right. And so the Japanese, see, and then the Japanese like uh, Kimura Nichiki, and Masuda Jiryo and, and Yamakami Sogen, who teach at Calcutta University, see themselves as aiding in that process. And Yamakami says that, you know, the most uh, important task for the Indian scholars is to recoup, to um, recover their tradition, the texts that have been lost to them and scattered and are now only preserved in Tibetan Chinese. Mm -hmm. And we can aid in that task, mm -hmm. help them recover their tradition. And so even if uh, it was only uh, in, on the level of scholarship, I think among learned Indians, it was considered an important part of, uh, of gaining autonomy and recovering a history. Right. Yeah. So I don't think I don't think that was, uh, you know, a reason to look down upon. Well, they it gave the it helped the Japanese justify their sense that they needed to actively be present and intervene. Okay. All right. In those regions, I think. Right. Yeah, I'm still, you know, it, it still fascinates me the where we began the conversation too, just um, of such a lack of knowledge about East Asian Buddhism that was in India. Um, and you are describing these different flows that are uh, going to Japan, but you also are, are bringing up this notion of kind of circulatory history or entangled history and things like that. So what, I mean, if you were to kind of thinking about the, that as a, a sort of flow or connected networks, um, and I think it's, it, it's a bit clearer to see exactly what's coming from uh, the Japanese contact with India, but are there other things you can notice or say about the about that circulation and what's happening on the Sri Lankan Indian side as well from the from yeah. the contact with those Japanese? So one of the other things that I really would like to emphasize, uh, and I don't know if I I have a tendency to not uh, highlight things enough in my in my writing, you know, mm. uh, it gets a little understated at times, I think. But uh, the role of South Asia as a real portal mm -hmm. for the circulation of ideas. And I, I recall a conversation I had with a 
a colleague, Ramachandra Guha, who was kind enough to read and write a blurb for the book. Uh, many, many years ago, we overlapped at Yale together. And he once said to me, he said, why is it that India has become such a generative place for theory, historical mm. theory, subaltern theory, uh, post-colonial theory, and Japan seems to be so much less so. Mm -hmm. And as I was working on this project, it again struck me the pivotal way in which India, because of the Anglophone education, colonial education, the flow of ideas from Europe and the United States into India through that Anglophone literature and the morphing of those ideas in the presence of other Asians made it generative for a kind of scholarship that, you know, again, I don't have any concrete evidence, but I have inklings that studying this scholarship of uh, Max Mueller or uh, Riz Davids in Calcutta University, the Japanese who were studying this stuff there, mm -hmm. Kawaguchi Akai was in Benares studying this stuff, is different than studying it in London. And the kind of interpretations that their Indian pundits are giving them of this stuff must have been different than what they would have gotten had they been studying it at Harvard. Right. And so, for example, you know, uh, I mentioned in the, I think I mentioned, no, I, I don't think I put it in the book, but Kosambi, the great uh, poly scholar, remarked about Riz David. Someone asked him, was his poly good? He said, well, it's not so good he can't speak it. Or <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> and there's that kind of understanding. Right. So someone like Kawaguchi Ekai, who was a pretty good Sanskritist and scholar of Tibetan, he learned his languages traditionally and he, his Sanskrit learning must have been based largely on memorization and Panini's grammar and things like that, rather than the kind of education he would have gotten had yeah. he gone and studied in London or studied at Harvard. Yeah. Uh, and so I think that uh, it then changes the way in which probably Sanskrit is taught, at least up until the end of the war, the Second World War, the Pacific War, in Japan, in the sectarian universities, where all of, most of the teachers are coming out of India, rather mm -hmm. than coming out of Europe or the United States in terms of their training. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of circulatory history, what, what I want to emphasize by using that is the way in which, you know, you try to think of a metaphor for what's going on here, as I mentioned in the last chapter of the book, and you see all these ideas, understandings, and people are in motion. And each region in Sri Lanka, in Japan, in South Asia, there is a revolution taking place in the understanding of the tradition they're wrestling with the incursion of Europeans and of colonialism and colonial education and Orientalist understandings of their traditions, and languages and, and textual corpus, each of these individuals. And they're encountering other Asians who are doing the same thing in their own way. Mm -hmm. And in the process, they're each transforming each other's understandings. Mm -hmm. So Kawaguchi Ekai is with Das and other Har Prasad Shastri in India as they're rethinking what scholarship should be in India and he's trying to rethink what Japanese Buddhism should be in Japan mm -hmm. and they're influencing each other and Kawaguchi Ekai goes back and what does he do? He starts preaching about the Bodhicharya Avatara <laughs> in his temple and so there's this and he's doing it having heard about this text in Lhasa, in Lhasa yeah. and from, from Das in uh, India, in Calcutta. Yeah. So uh, that's in circulatory history, I think, emphasizes the way in which these things are continually transform, transforming. It's not these discrete billiard balls that hit each other. 
they yeah. remain discreet. They change in the process of contacting each other. Yeah. And it's very hard to come up with a metaphor that expresses fully the complicated. I think Indra's net actually gets close. Yeah. Maybe yeah. the best way to talk about it, rather than circulatory history, it's this Indra's net kind of mm. view of, of what's going on here with these various mirrors reflecting yeah. each other. But, the but also you get a very, you get kind of a, a similar thing with your, I mean, just to, since you're, you know, uh, had already written on DT Suzuki and are, are going back to do more on that too. Yeah. In a sense, you get I, what seems to me a, a kind of a similar model in some ways too, where Suzuki comes and lectures at Columbia and spends all this time, you know, and LaSalle and all of that. And then you see in Japan, the kind of uh, effect of that coming back and, and re- configuring uh, Zen in Japan based on what abroad, had taken off kind of abroad or appealed to uh, people abroad as well. So yeah. I think it's an effective met metaphor. I mean, the other thing about South Asia for the Japanese is, is it becomes a, a window to Europe for them too, and to the United yeah. States in terms of publishing. The Calcutta University Press publishes one thing after another. And then, you know, I mentioned Masuda Jirio working on uh, th that uh, text about the affiliation of uh, the Theravada, well, Pali Buddhism, well, not, no, uh, Hinayana Buddhism, what we would call Hinayana Buddhism, or mainstream Nikaya Buddhism. Mm -hmm. And then he goes off and studies with Walliser in Germany, and Walliser then translates the text into German. So mm -hmm. there's influence going the other way that the Japanese are putting out stuff into the world of Buddhist scholarship in English through the doorway or window of India. Yeah. Uh, and this then becomes accessible to European and American scholars mm -hmm. who then rethink what they're doing in light of the Japanese scholarship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's another way in which I, I see this uh, is a circulatory process. Yeah. Of course, uh, water flows downhill and it's inescapable that what the Japanese are learning and are uh, wrestling with are these ideas that are flowing out of Europe and the United States, mm -hmm. even if they're coming through the lens of uh, these Indian scholars and pundits, right. they're still, uh, you know, that's where the center of gravity is for them and they need to deal with it. But they're attempt to establish the legitimacy of Mahayana, and here it does connect with D.T. Suzuki, one of the uh, missions of the Eastern Buddhist Society, when he founds it in 1921, picking up on sort of the masthead of a very short-lived journal called the, Ma the Mahayanist, it was published in Japan 1915, 1916, but in 1921, he moves to Otani, he starts the Eastern Buddhist Society, one of the missions with, you know, with his wife, with, with Beatrice Lane and with Sasaki Gesho and some other individuals is to, he said, they say it's to establish the legitimacy, the orthodoxy of Mahayana Buddhism. It's not this crazy idolatrous, uh, you know, uh, form of Buddhism, sort of Buddhism gone awry from the original teachings and to show its legitimacy. Uh, that's one of its missions. I think that people like Kimura Nichiki and, and Yamakami Sogen teaching in India felt a similar calling yeah. in their work. I think that that's actually a really wonderful place to kind of tie things together or, or tie things up here in a sense because okay. you sort of wrapped uh, around from uh, Japan to South and Southeast Asia and then went basically around the world uh, to Europe and America and then back to Japan again. So we're... Uh, Sort of, uh, it was a, a very uh, excellent example, I think, to just not only illustrate the this issue of circulatory history, but also to show the range uh, uh, that you cover in this book, which is really fascinating, just in terms of the the people flow of people, flow of ideas, flows of things, but also the, the kind of methodologies and ways you open your eyes to other things besides kind of just the narrow. Uh, kind of Buddhist studies look at things, but actually showing that these other incidental kind of histories were really quite formative in in, in all of that, including uh, uh, travel, tourism, uh, industry, all of it. Um, 
And uh, so uh, first, just thank you very much for spending the time uh, to talk with us uh, today about the, your book, Seeking Shakyamuni. Uh, it's a fascinating read. Um, and uh, for me, it just really opened my eyes to so many uh, connections that uh, had you, I think a lot of us in Buddhist studies or people that work on this area kind of sense some of those or notice them at times. But um, for me, it really uh, tied them up into a, a really compelling story that helped to make sense of a lot of it. So thank you very much, Professor Jack. My pleasure. Mm -hmm.